Hi, I'm BJ Lang. The mission of Testicular Cancer Awareness Foundation is important for me not only as a board member, but as a two-time testicular cancer survivor. Did you know that testicular cancer is the leading cancer for young men 15 to 44? But it can strike at any age. TCAF promotes the importance of early detection through the practice of monthly self-exams. So check out testiscancer.org to learn more and follow us on social media at Testis Cancer to be an advocate in the fight against testicular cancer. Awareness and early detection are key. All right, welcome to Dumbest in the Room podcast. I'm here today with um, someone who is another one of my personal superheroes and has saved many other lives. He's a he works at Indiana University Hospital. Uh, he's an associate professor of urology, and he's also a surgeon. And today we're going to be talking about surgery and and what that's like. And thanks for joining me, Dr. Clint Carey. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, looking forward to it today, and uh, can't wait to get started. So, in looking at your bio, I saw that you have attended quite a lot of schools and uh, I'm interested to know about that and and sort of how you determined that urology is where you wanted to specialize. Yeah, it's uh, uh, so I, I grew up in Tennessee uh, in a small town in Tennessee. My uh, basically my entire family had went to the University of Tennessee and uh, and so that was what uh, my parents uh, had kind of decided for me is what they were going to help me with from a financial perspective and so that kind of led me there. Um, and then after that, continued that tradition at Tennessee with the going to medical school uh, there. And then um, after medical school, I actually wound up uh, coming to Indiana University for uh, my urology training. And so that really uh, uh, set me on the, the path that I um, am on currently and, and, and it let me basically be introduced to you. Um, you know, how that how I decided on urology is um, uh, a bit um, kind of um, not complicated, but just kind of a roundabout way. Um, <clears throat> I, I wasn't someone who grew up uh, saying I was going to be a physician or a doctor or a surgeon for that matter. I was preoccupied like most young kids uh, with other things and doing sports and um, uh kind of came about it, uh, through, uh, some volunteer work, um, uh, in the healthcare field. And that grew my interest uh, enough to go to medical school. And then in medical school, actually, because of my, uh, entry in sports uh, or interest in sports, uh, I actually thought I was going to be an orthopedic surgeon for a while. Um, but certainly knew that some sort of surgical field was going to be, uh, uh, something that grabbed my interest. And then, uh, you know, and, and exploring some of those things as everyone does, as you go through medical school, um, uh, there were some influential people and kind of chance interactions that you have and kind of led me towards urology. And then, um, uh, when I, uh, uh, came to Indiana university for training, uh, that kind of cemented my interest in, uh, not on urology, but, uh, just on onco the oncology field of urology in general. And then because of the long kind of storied history of testis cancer at Indiana university, um, uh, that, uh, is kind of how I, uh, became interested. And I, I had some great mentors along the way that taught me how, uh, to do the surgery efficiently and appropriately, uh, for patients like yourself. And, um, uh, uh, just to complete some of that schooling talk. Um, so after my training here at Indiana university, um, I wanted to do a couple years additional fellowship training just to cement, um, my understanding and role of, um, uh, cancer care in the field of urology. So I did a fellowship in oncology and I just wanted a different experience, uh, just to see how, uh, different places do things. And so I went, out to California for that at UCSF. And then while I was there, um, uh, to be in academics, I wanted to, um, uh, feel completely prepared to, to do not only the clinical work, but some of the academic and research work. And so while I was there, I went, uh, and did a, uh, master's degree and, and got a master's in public health. And, um, uh, that was from the university of California, Berkeley. Um, and, uh, and that's kind of helped me, uh, fulfill some of those academic uh, endeavors along with the clinical work that we do uh, here at Indiana. So uh, very long-winded explanation, but there you go. 
Yeah. Hey, I am definitely the dumbest one in the room. That is for sure. <laughs> okay. So you talked about uh, Indiana University being having kind of the storied history with testicular cancer. Um, I'm assuming you're talking about Dr. Einhorn and how he sort of developed the treatment for it. Right. Right. Yeah. It's, um, it, you know, believe it or not, some of the testis cancer work actually started at Indiana before Dr. Einhorn. Um, obviously, his role and his impact on the field is, is uh, extremely well known. Um, uh, but one of our previous chairman of our department, uh, Dr. John Donahue, um, uh, really pioneered the operation that we still do today, this retroperitoneal lymph node dissection. Um, and, uh, at that time when he was doing this, uh, there really wasn't any chemotherapy that offered, uh, a lot of significant chances for cure. And so at that time, uh, surgery was the only, um, uh, great option, at least from a curative standpoint for men with testis cancer. Um, and so a lot of patients sought him out, um, all from all over the country, uh, to come here. And so he had a vast experience in that operation and, uh, Dr. Einhorn uh, came on as a, a new staff, uh, and because of his some of his uh, experience and his training, um, uh, was interested in treating some testicular cancer patients, and asked Dr. Donahue if he could, you know, see some of his patients and, and offer them uh, some potential chemotherapy regimens, and and the rest is kind of history. Um, the combination of those two individuals at Indiana University in the 60s, 70s, and and so forth. Um, really set the care for testis cancer um, just on a whirlwind path and the su survival rates um, uh, skyrocketed with the combination of uh, cisplatin-based chemotherapy and surgery uh, either before or after chemotherapy. Those two guys really uh, uh, were huge contributors to not only the field of testis cancer, but certainly for Indiana University's mark uh, on the treatment for patients with testis cancer. Yeah, that's awesome. And you're definitely continuing the legacy because one of the other things I wanted to talk about was how people from all over the country travel to see you because you are one of, if not the best at the retroperitoneal lymph node dissection in the, in the country. Well, <clears throat> I appreciate those kind words. Um, I, I do operate on a lot of patients um, from around the country and, and some even outside the country that decide to come uh, to see us here. Um, and and you're right. I mean, probably 70% of the patients that I uh, do surgery on uh, uh, for testicular cancer are not from Indiana. They're from all over the, so I operate on more people that are uh, outside of Indiana than, than are here in the state. Um, and, you know, that's, you know, I, I, I'm able to do this because of the significant people that came before me uh, and took the interest in, in doing that. And certainly my, uh, the, Dr. Donahue trained uh, several people, but one of the important ones was uh, Rich Foster, who was my main mentor for uh, teaching me how to do this operation. And I'm, I'm extremely grateful um, that uh, he took an interest in me and teaching me. And, and uh, uh, I think he understood as well the importance of the legacy of uh, uh, surgical management uh, for patients like yourself. And um, I've certainly... Uh, uh, taking that role seriously and, and certainly try to help uh, carry that torch for uh, the program. That's awesome. All right, let's talk specifically about the RPLND, which is the short for the retroperitoneal lymph node dissection. So for yeah. anyone who's listening, explain what the retroperitoneum is and, and why that is the area that testicular cancer metastasizes to. Yeah, so the, the retroperitoneum is, you know, kind of a, if you've never heard it before, it seems like this weird term. Uh, it's basically a, an area that, um, uh, so inside our abdomens, um, we have our in, intestines and um, stomach and some other organs. And then um, actually behind those uh, organs uh, are blood vessels and, um, uh, that uh, run north and south in our body. Um, those are the two largest blood vessels, and there's a lot of lymphatic tissue around those uh, blood vessels. And so because those uh, uh, lymph nodes and blood vessels are behind the intestines, that's where the retro part comes from, so retro or behind uh, the peritoneum, uh, so retroperitoneum. So it's, the peritoneum is just kind of inside the main part of the abdomen, 
And so the retroperitoneum is kind of behind the main part, which is where these lymph nodes are that um, testis cancer uh, likes to spread to. And those lymph nodes are one of the most common spots, if not the most common spot that testicular cancer will drain to through the lymphatic system. Uh, and testis cancer is very predictable in that way. Um, uh, we do know that most often if it leaves the testicle, uh, the first spot it goes to is in these lymph nodes in the retroperitoneum. Uh, and it's pretty predictable about which, how, how it's going to drain away from the testicle if it, if it decides to get out. Mm -hmm. um, and actually some of that work uh, was uh, discovered and, and added to um, by some early studies here at Indiana University about describing uh, if you had a testicular cancer in your left testicle, uh, like yourself, then um, uh, where is it going to be most likely to spread to? And and we learned over time and from those studies that um, uh, the most likely lymph lymphatic spots of that uh, and where it will be draining. And so um, that's kind of the, the description of it and uh, where it's likely to go. So when you see a new patient and, and, um, you know, they've had chemo like myself and you don't know if it's still cancer or if it's scar tissue, I think mine was scar tissue. Um, I don't know if you've recently, that's looked correct. It. Yeah, that's correct. So you still do it anyway, currently, you, cause there's no way to know if it's that's still right. cancer. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that hopefully is, is in the process of changing. It's not, it's not going to be perfect, um, in the near term, but, um, you know, you're, you're right. So after you, if, so if you have this, the cancer that spreads into your lymph nodes in your abdomen, um, depending on the situation, a lot of guys go through chemotherapy and then after the chemotherapy, um, uh, there can be residual and large lymph nodes. Um, we, uh, know that that represents one of three things. It's either going to be just scar tissue or uh, active uh, testicular cancer that just didn't completely respond to the chemotherapy, or it could be another uh, type of testis cancer called teratoma. Um, so we know it's going to be one of those three things. Um, now, the unfortunate part is we don't know which one of those three it's going to be, um, and the, no imaging studies or blood work can uh, tell us which, which one of those it's going to be, despite uh, having tumor markers to evaluate things and fancy imaging studies. Uh, it's, none of it is good enough to tell us which one of those three it is. If we knew you just had scar tissue, we would say you don't need to have surgery. It's just scar tissue. Mm -hmm. um, uh, teratoma needs to be removed because you can't treat that with chemotherapy. And usually small residual cancer cells need to be removed because those obviously didn't respond to the chemotherapy. Um, um, now, there are some new uh, blood tests that are kind of coming through the research pipeline that, that may uh, be able to help us answer some of those questions. Um, and there is, there's one particular test uh, called a microRNA371. Uh, so that's in our bloodstream. Um, it's, it's elevated in men who have testis cancer. Uh, it does respond to treatment. So if all the cancer has been removed or treated, it usually um, uh, goes back down to a normal range um, where previously it's elevated. Uh, it does seem to be more accurate than the current tumor markers, um, uh, such as AFP or beta-ACG. But um, uh, its limitation is that it doesn't do well with determining teratoma. Um, so, so it's an advance, uh, or it's, it seems to be an advance. It's not quite ready for, yeah. um, uh, primetime clinical use yet, but, uh, it, it will be an advance if it does uh, bear out to fruition, um, and a certain number of uh, patients for sure. So that'll be, that'll be a, a helpful scenario. That'll be something that'll maybe allow us to avoid some of these, uh, surgeries in, in certain patients, uh, and maybe direct us to surgery for patients for sure that, that need it based on those results. That would be great. All right. So I want to jump back a little bit. I want to talk about surgery specifically. So let's talk about what a general week is for you. You, you are a, t a professor and then you have days where you do surgery. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, uh, so typical week. So I, I usually do surgery on, on, um, uh, roughly three days a week. I have clinic one day a week and then I have uh, research time as well, kind of built in, 
to some of those days, um, particularly one major day. And, um, uh, you know, those, those days, as far as from a testis cancer surgery, you know, every week's a little variable. Uh, it'll maybe just be one of those types of surgeries that week. To, I've done as many as six of those surgeries in a week. Um, so the weeks can be variable. Um, uh, uh, during those process, we are, we, we're an academic hospital, so we're training uh, uh, what's called residents uh, to um, be trained urologists. And... Um, uh, and, and when they're finished with their training, they're, um, fully trained urologists. So we, some of that is teaching them how to, uh, uh, go through these surgeries, um, uh, having them come to clinic with us and teaching them about, uh, patient care, clinical aspects of it. Um, uh, at times, uh, giving some lectures about various aspects of urology. Um, and then, um, uh, I do. I am. Uh, I do have some funding from uh, grants to uh, do some research in certain areas that uh, I dedicate um, a good portion of my time to as well. So, mm-hmm. uh, busy week, uh, but rewarding and fulfilling for sure. Yeah, it sounds like a lot of fun. Is it anything like Grey's Anatomy, <laughs> or is that over dramatized? <laughs> um, I wish it was as fun as Grey's Anatomy. Grey's Anatomy is pretty entertaining. Uh, no, I think. <laughs> I think. Uh, Grey's Anatomy is, uh, and there's, there's obviously some parallels, but it's, uh, made for TV for sure. There's a lot of drama, uh, in yeah. that show. All right. So on a, on a typical day of surgery, obviously you need to be on your, on your game. So like you wake up in the morning, like what, what does a surgeon eat for breakfast? <laughs> What's the breakfast of surgeons? Yeah, I'm sure everybody's different. I actually don't eat a big breakfast in the mornings. I actually get up um, most mornings around 4 a.m. Um, I, I try to, uh, get a workout in before I come to work. Um, just because, uh, when you get home at night, it's just, it's hard. I have, I have some uh, young kids at home. And so trying to get home, uh, spend some time with them, workouts, just, it's not feasible. So I try to get up early, get a workout in. Um, I usually have a small breakfast, um, uh, uh, not really anything, uh, too substantial, uh, some coffee to kind of wake yourself up a little bit, hydrate with some water and you're ready to go. Yeah. Wow. Pretty, pretty simple. It sounds, um, all right. So let's, I want to talk about like this step-by-step of the RPLND specifically. Um, so you, obviously there's anesthesia and then you come Mm -hmm. in and what do you do? Yeah. So, you know, this surgery is one that, um, you know, we use that term RPLND for, for these surgeries. Um, uh, and it's, and it's somewhat unique in that, um, we give this name to the surgery, but the surgery is completely different depending on each and indi- each and every individual patient. Um, and that's largely because everybody has different pattern of spread of their, uh, cancer. Uh, so, uh, some of the surgeries are completely straightforward. Um, uh, and some of them are more complicated. Sometimes um, uh, to get things removed, we, we have to go to the extremes of removing um, uh, other organs like the kidney. Um, sometimes we have to remove the aorta, the main blood vessel in the abdomen, uh, and replace it with a graft. Wow. Um, and, and so it goes from very straightforward to very complicated. Uh, and, th- and that depends on every, everybody's individual case. Um, 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 but in general, you know, for the, uh, I don't want to say average, uh, patient, but I guess I would say the straightforward, uh, one of these cases, um, um, you know, we, we, uh, you, you have to know anatomy extremely well for this, for this surgery, I guess, really for any, most surgeons should know anatomy quite well, but, um, the, the knowledge of the anatomy in this area is, is extremely important. Um, because you're operating around the biggest blood vessels in, in the body. Mm -hmm. Um, and so you have to know, uh, where, where things are to, um, to do things efficiently and appropriately. Um, um, but when we start the surgery, you know, we have to, you know, like we talked about earlier, uh, the area that we're getting to is behind, uh, the intestines. And so we have to move the intestines out of the way and find those blood vessels 
And the way that I think here at Indiana, we like to think about how we do the operation is we want to um, dissect all the important structures away from the residual tumor or lymph node or mass, whichever term you want to use. Mm -hmm. um, so we want to dissect those important structures away from the, the mass. Um, uh, so, you know, if, if the kidney is close, we want to get the kidney away. If the aorta is, um, uh, uh, attached to these uh, lymph nodes, we want to dissect the aorta away from it. Uh, and, and a lot of times these lymph nodes are, uh, attached to the, uh, to the body, to the posterior body wall or the spine. And so once we get those structures out of the way, then we just have to remove the mass. And so that's kind of how we do things efficiently and, um, uh, minimize blood loss for the operation. Um, cause once you have the important things away and, and safely, um, either behind, um, uh, retractors or things like that, then, then, uh, all you got to do is remove the, the cancer or the teratoma or whatever's still there. Um, so that's, um, kind of a quick synopsis. I don't know if that's what you're looking for. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I just have some random questions mm -hmm. stemming off of that. So obviously for in mine, I, and I think probably every case you cut from like under the ribs down past the mm -hmm. belly button. Yeah. And, uh, I believe you told me you didn't cut muscle. So how, okay. how does that, how does that happen? Yeah. So, um, so we have our abdominal muscles and, um, there's a natural, um, uh, so we have kind of a right and a left set of abdominal muscles. Um, and there's a natural plane in between those, uh, where there's no muscle, the there's kind of tissue that just comes together and connects those muscles, but there's no actual muscle there. And so we, we use that, natural plane to, to divide that, to go inside the abdomen. And, um, that obviously helps with healing, uh, because we don't have to cut through any muscle, but, um, because of that anatomy, uh, it allows us to, to get into the abdomen without, uh, cutting any muscle. And, um, everybody's incision, uh, is a little bit different just based on how you're made on the inside. Mm -hmm. Um, some people have longer abdomens and some people have shorter abdomens. Um, and then the, the relation to your belly button to where these blood vessels are back in your abdomen is always a little different with everybody. So, um, everybody's incision is usually a little different just based on how they're built uh, on the inside. All right. So when you've stretched everything open and mm -hmm. you said you move all of the organs, mm -hmm. do you move them like out of the cavity or do you like just push them out of the way? So, um, uh, also depends on the person. Sometimes we um, just kind of move them out of the way and we have them held with these kind of special surgical instruments that kind of keep them back uh, out of harm's way, so to speak. Um, and then sometimes in order to see things uh, appropriately, we do have to like uh, kind of bring them up out of the incision uh, to be able to see things appropriately. So again, uh, that also just depends on the person and kind of how they're built. Uh, some people we can keep all those, uh, most of the intestines is what we're talking about. Um, um, uh, uh, there's, you know, times certainly we can keep those inside, just kind of move them out of the way and hold them back out of the way. And there's other times when we have to bring them up, um, uh, kind of out of the abdomen and, and retract them that way. And you know, the difference between all of them just from doing it over and over again, or from your anatomy class? Cause I imagine it looks pretty mushy and, and, <laughs> and gross and bloody in there. Right. Yeah. No, no, not really. I mean, really? it's, it's interesting, you know, it's, um, it, it is, it's truly, um, remarkable. I think that, uh, you know, you can be around the biggest blood vessels in, in our body and do these cases well, where, you only lose 25 or 50 cc's of blood during these cases. I mean, that's pretty remarkable to think you're operating around the biggest blood vessels in the body and you don't really lose any blood. Um, and, and so that, that's, again, just speaks to knowledge of anatomy. And, and obviously I think, you know, like anything in life, the more you do of it, uh, the more efficient and better you get at it. Um, and that's actually important in, in testicular cancer because, um, you know, it, it is, it is a relatively rare, um, cancer to get, uh, you know, there's only about 
you know, somewhere over 9,000 men a year in the United States that get diagnosed with it, which is still a, a substantial number. But um, when you compare it to some of the other cancers like colon cancer and prostate cancer, which has over, you know, 200,000 men a year diagnosed with it, breast cancer in women, also hundreds of thousands of women diagnosed it. It's not a lot when you compare it to those. Um, and then in that number of men each year, the majority of, of guys don't need this operation. So, so it is a pretty rare uh, surgery, which um, uh, also makes experience important to get, um, uh, you know, good, good results and good care. Speaking of experience, I, I know we both attended the Testicular Cancer Awareness Foundation virtual conference, and they were talking about the importance of going to a high-volume center, which Indiana University is. And I guess, that is that because of the side effect that is possible of retrograde, retro, retrograde ejaculation? And you guys just have more experience with sparing the nerves? Yeah, I, I think... Um we certainly have a lot of experience with that. And, and what I talked about earlier with uh, Dr. Donahue in our department, I mean, he helped pioneer some of that uh, nerve sparing anatomy and understanding of it. He, he uh, uh, certainly helped uh, in that realm back in the seventies and eighties about how to do that operation um, to maintain normal ejaculation. Uh, and obviously that experience has been passed down over the years. And so um uh, I mean, you know, I think um, there's something to be said, you know, from knowing the anatomy, but then also seeing and, and uh, looking at it over and over and over. And so I, I, that obviously, I think, translates into good results. Um, uh, but that, yeah, that's one of the aspects. And, you know, it's a complex operation, like we talked about. Sometimes it can get pretty complicated uh, around some of these big blood vessels uh, that, that are back there that testis cancer is kind of attracted to. Um, and so that experience and just uh, being able to get pa patients kind of in and out of the operating room without, you know, significantly long surgery times, all that helps with their recovery after surgery. Uh, and certainly from, from a fertility standpoint, uh, those results um, come uh, with, with experience. And um, uh, so, yeah, so I think it's a combination of factors. Um, uh, why, why patients decide to come see us. Yeah. Well, I'm glad I did. Um, and I have another question about just doing surgery in general. So how do you stay focused when you're doing it? I mean, obviously you have to tune out kind of the outside world and any problems you got going on or whatever to focus strictly on your patient and kind of piggybacking on that. Like, are you thinking about the patient, the patient's personal life? Are you thinking about their family that came with them to their appointment or are you strictly just in there cutting, cut yeah. and drying? <clears throat> I mean, I think, um, I, you know, I, I have a lot of people ask me that question, even, you know, friends that aren't in medicine, um, uh, you know, that may live next door to me. Um, I think there, there are certainly parts of the operation, certainly of this particular operation that, that can get, you know, in, intense in the moment. And um, it, it is hard to describe. I mean, time flies by in the operating room. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you may be in there for four hours and it seems like 30 minutes. Um, so I think there is a kind of a, um, a level of concentration that happens that it's hard to put into words. Um, you um, obviously, you know, that you've met uh, in a lot of cases, you've met the patient's family, um, and so they, um, are not something that you're thinking about in those moments. I mean, you're, you're pretty focused in on what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I can't say the entire time in the operating room is, is so intense, but there's definitely good portions of that, that are, uh, pretty intensive. And so during those times, you know, it's like time doesn't exist. It, you're, you're zoned in, you're in, if there's a, a zone, you know, a surgery zone, yeah. I think most surgeons know know what that is. Time just flies by. I guess that that zone keeps you focused. Absolutely, and you don't. Uh, you know, I, I kind of. I guess you could relate it back. I remember growing up as a kid. You know, my dad would be watching some sports show, and my mom would be trying to get his attention, and like <laughs> he's zoned in. He's watching it. He's who's going to score the next touchdown. Um, so it's like you kind of get zoned in. I mean, maybe like 
I don't know, professional athletes do when they, I don't know, Michael Jordan or LeBron James rips off crazy amount of points they can't miss. You, you just, yeah. you have this feeling or, or sensation. I mean, time just stands still in there. So there's definitely a zone, I think. Gotcha. And last question, because we're running out of time. How do you uh, decompress? Because I imagine it's it's a very high stress job and probably hard to separate your personal thoughts from the I would say quote tragedies that you yeah. see. Yeah. Yeah. I think you have to do that. I think, uh, I think that's important, um, to, uh, uh, kind of have some decompression time for sure. I mean, I, I have, um, uh, younger kids and so obviously spending some family time helps some of those uh, young kids are in sports. And so helping them with sports and, uh, being with my wife and having some downtime, um, uh, I think is important. Um, uh, I think that's the biggest, uh, um, aspect of this. I mean, I think if you're, uh, speaking about the zone, I think if you're so intense all the time with no time off, I mean, you're, you're going to, you're going to burn out. You're going to have some, some days that, that, uh, you just don't feel like you can do it. So, uh, that's important. Everybody does different things. I mean, you know, there's people that, that, you know, kind of meditate and breathing exercises that kind of decompress, uh, any of those things that people need, I think are worthwhile. I mean, certainly with, uh, I mean, some of those kind of taking care of yourself, um, exercises have obviously been highlighted with this, uh, you know, COVID pandemic about taking care of yourself, your mental health and stuff like that, um, across the board. Uh, I think some of that comes into play in the daily life of, of uh, a lot of physicians, um, uh, so, uh, some of those things you have to do, otherwise you'll, you'll certainly kind of, uh, burn out. Yeah. Do you have any advice for any potential future surgeons and urologists? Um, I mean, I think for, certainly for trainees, I mean, I, I think you have to, um, you know, find what, uh, what speaks to you. I mean, I, I, I can't say that I, I didn't go to medical school saying that, I wanted to be a testicular cancer surgeon. Um, uh, there's certain people along your path um, that influence you. Um, there's certain things that happen that influence you. Um, there's disappointments that happen that guide your path. Uh, I think all those are learning opportunities. And um, I think, you know, once you kind of figure out your path and what interests you, uh, you got to dedicate yourself to it. Um, you know, it's long hours, uh, to, uh, to train a urologist and for them to be highly efficient. Um, and, uh, you know, practicing in the operating room, outside the operating room, thinking about how to make yourself better. Um, I think I tried to do that when I was going through my training and I think we try to encourage that of our trainees here at Indiana. Um, it, it requires dedication, uh, for sure. That's great advice. And, uh, just, Thank you again for, for taking the time to talk to me and hopefully next year's testicular cancer conference is in person and I can shake your hand for being a hero. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm glad we were able to have it at least in a virtual format this year, but yeah, I agree. It'd be nice to be in person next year for sure. Great. Thank you so much again. Yeah. Thanks for having me.